Seven, seven o'clock, or a little after, I'd like to open up a hearing for a review of Village Hill Master Plan by Mass Development. And about to have a quick presentation, I guess. <coughs> um, I don't know where to put this for maximum. You can just send it in, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there may be some folks who want to see it, so you might have to do that. <laughs> yeah, just like, oh, yeah. okay. Thanks. Yeah, this is the same thing. Maybe you could put the board for the public, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. You can put it in that, um, you can put, um, put it on the chalkboard. Okay. <clears throat> Looks like a villain. <coughs> yeah, I think I, I think these guys can look at the paper. Okay. Dave was twisting. See the gazette. I'm Beth Murphy from Mass Development. I'm the project manager off of Village Hill. And uh, thank you for scheduling me in. I wanted to just give you an update on uh, the master plan. Uh, there was some expression of frustration last time, which I can understand that you're just seeing this one site plan application at a time. So I kind of wanted to refresh everybody's memory and go over where we're at. Uh, so starting on the south campus, which is uh, pretty much done, uh, there was the first tenant, which is Rose Park on Earl Street. Uh, Cole Morgan has the majority of the rest of the campus. And that leaves just two commercial lots left, and that's 12B, also on Earl Street. Uh, the plan shows that to be uh, a building of about 10,000 square feet. We're showing it as light industrial. Um, it could also be office space or R&D. Uh, there's nothing prohibiting it from being that. Um, and it has a shared parking area with Bolts Clark. Um, and then around in front of Cole Morgan, there's lot one. Uh, which is on Prince Street. And what that shows on that plan is about 42 parking spaces, 42, 44 parking spaces. Again, a footprint just as a placeholder. It can be office, it can be retail. Um, when the right driver comes along, uh, we'll figure that out and that would become a site plan application. So then crossing to the north, across Prince Street, um, what you saw on the 13th was lot 18, that was Jonathan's um, presentation of a 16,000 square foot building. And he's got 12,000 square foot of office space in that, <coughs> uh, a restaurant, and two retail spaces. Um, and so he will go there, and then what we always anticipated is that there would be shared parking on lot 19. And we also anticipate an assisted living. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why at the master plan level we put assisted living there. Um, one was that all of the assisted living developers who came forward said that was their preferred location. Um, and also, <coughs> assisted living doesn't require a lot of parking. So you could get the assisted living building and the reduced number of parking in this kind of shared parking area. Um, one other thing that you uh, noticed or probably noticed last time when you looked at the Lot 18 site plan application is that Lot 18 and Lot 19 have a shared drainage system. They're not supposed to uh, drain, and they can't drain actually into any of the detention systems. So when Jonathan came forward with his plan, he not only advanced his plan, we did a lot of the engineering to advance the drainage work on Lot 19. So now we know, uh, and you're going to see in a couple of weeks, assisted living can go up here, and we can have this space for an approximately 20,000 square foot office building and the parking that that would need. And we know that the drainage will support <coughs> it. So the plan was a guide. Uh, now that we have real developers uh, looking at the lot, we know more about it. And, uh, we're able to address that. On this side of the street, you see office retail. 
And what that is, is we own this piece of property. Uh, in order for this to be a real lot, we need to own about that much more property. We're currently in discussions with DMH to see if we can get that additional property to make this a viable commercial lot. Excuse me. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but for recording purposes, can you speak at the podium? Because we can't hear you or see you at all. Okay. I'm so okay. sorry. That's <laughs> okay. Pointed to another place, but the time I looked up, I didn't see it. Yeah, it was. You don't think it's still there? Oh, then the one's going in. I'm not sure. Hmm? Is this where the assistant yeah. building's going? Yep. Because it's not this one. This one. Yep. This yep. Here. Yeah, that's yeah. the one that we, we, we <clears throat> gave la last week. The, these two. <laughs> you want a pointer? <laughs> uh, a laser pointer, then you can stand at the podium. The next meeting. Yeah. No, I I can. Okay. I'll just point with my. Phone. Okay. Um, okay, so we're moving up Village Hill Road. On this side is lot 20. Uh, this is in front of the uh, hillside apartments that exist there, the two brick buildings. Um, again, that's, it's a footprint put there. We want to market that for office retail. Across the street is the male attendance building. Um, we've looked at a number of options for this building. We're committed to keeping it. Uh, it's, it's a tough sell because uh, the interior layout, nine foot ceilings, it it's, would be very tough and expensive to renovate. Um, but we've figured out a, a plan that will work for the parking and we're going to keep at it until we find somebody who can make use of that. Um, and we've also discussed live work um, in that situation. The real challenge for the male attendance is finding the funding that would make it feasible. Um, so that, I think, takes care of the commercial. Oh, no, last but not least, the coach house. Uh, the coach house is right in the center, and that's slated for commercial development. Um, we've had a number of offers on that, really nice companies. Uh, again, it's an existing building. It's a lovely building. It takes <coughs> some development expertise to actually carry out the renovation of it. Um, so. We are confident we're, that we're getting closer to the right buyer. Um, we have just about finished uh, Ford Crossing, which connects the coach house into the rest of the street system. Um, we think that gives it more appeal because now it's in a completely finished state. So that's the commercial on site. Uh, then we go to the residential. Here is the 11 uh, right builders, Morningside Homes all built, all occupied. Right Builders, again, the Eastview townhomes, uh, 11 townhomes here. Over here is the uh, Pequoy, 24 lots, uh, small housing development. I'm sorry, I neglected to mention Agora on the south campus. They're doing uh, four houses. All of those have been permitted by you. Uh, the next, oh, and also then Beachwood, which is also a right development over here. Uh, and then we think the next thing that's going to come to you in terms of residential is this townhouse area. Um, we're in discussions with the developer right now, uh, and we think probably a couple of months away from a site plan application on that. Um, as I mentioned, the assisted living, we've been working hard. We've assisted living again. We've had a number of offers on that lot. Um, we went out and searched for an assisted living developer, and we think we found a really good one uh, in Christopher Heights, who I believe is going to be on your agenda on uh, October 11th. And uh, they were able to make use of this lot right here. Uh, and they're going to have a three-story, uh, roughly 50,000 square foot building there, associated parking. Um, and what we really liked about them, and in addition to liking their operation, we visited their sites and were really impressed with the uh, quality of the care. But we also liked their philosophy of doing assisted living, which is to have 50% affordable units. Um, so that, that just fits in so well with Village Hill that we were blessed to uh, bring them on board. And you'll hear more about that 
So where were you pointing when you said that? You were pointing not to where it says assisted living. You were pointing to where it says live work when you said this. Yeah. Okay, so the, the, where it says live work here, that's you're talking about assisted living there. Right, and this is like this is part of the evolution of the master plan. So you know, as far as we could see, this was going to be the assisted living lot, but we've been able to find somebody who could use utilize this lot. Um, it works from their perspective. It works from our perspective. It. It's a nice transition from commercial to residential, um, and we actually think it works better than Lot 19. And Lot 19, where it says assisted living, that's just general office space now? That's the goal? Yeah. What, mm -hmm. now, now that, again, now that Wright has come in with the Lot 18 development, uh, we've made a reassessment of Lot 19, um, and we think a 20,000 square foot office building would go nicely there. Um, if you drive over to the site in the past few weeks, you'll see that Beech Tree Park is under construction and uh, the north, south, east, west routes that uh, were discussed as part of uh, Wright Builder's site plan application for Beechwood um, are in place. Um, it's shaping up nicely. Um, so, And actually, now that Ford Crossing is just about built, this whole part of the campus is uh, pretty well uh, completed. Uh, we still have the build out to be done over here. Um, and of course, this to come before you. But w we know we have a really good sense of what's coming here. All the roads are in here, which defines the lots. So it's really up here that's still um, a little vaguer. We, uh, in uh, the beginning of this year, the, the end of last year and the beginning of this, this year, had our engineers and our uh, master planner take another look at everything. And what they did was eliminate some of the roads, uh, realign some of the roads to make it work better with the grading, to make there be less roads uh, because there was too much road for the amount of housing you were putting in there. Um, we also asked them to test out a co-housing option um, and this has been uh, out there in the public for about uh, six or eight months. Um, and what we, we haven't really had a lot of uh, co-housing, we, ha we haven't had any co-housing <laughs> developers who have uh, talked about that. But what we have had is some interest in cluster housing, which is fine with us too. Um, you know, as I've said probably too many times, this is just a guide to where we're going. It's our best guess. It's our estimate of how things are going to happen as each developer comes along with an actual proposal uh, then we can fill in the pieces and that that's when it comes to you as a site plan application so any any questions I can answer any yeah Once. there's still no retail I'm wondering what efforts have been made to market the retail parcels I know that Jonathan Wright talked about retail on 18, but he doesn't, he clearly doesn't have any tenants at this point. Right, and, and this is the, what Mass Development is doing is trying to provide the best framework to attract uh, developers to do this. Um, and so uh, Jonathan has made provision for retail. Um, he's got 75% of the building in office, so it's, it's gonna be a live and active building to begin with, but he's made provision for two retail and restaurant um, and he's working with Opal to try to get those leased up. Um, the issue has been and all along is the uh, retail is usually the last component that comes into development uh, because retail wants the traffic, the foot traffic and the, the uh, folks working on site so that it can know that it has a captured audience for uh, people to come there. So we, we think that Jonathan is the start of, of uh, more of that happening. Um, when we get this additional parcel from DMH, uh, we think that's the next logical place for retail to go. This has a lot of potential, a lot of visibility. Um, we have brokers. Uh, we have Colebrook and Goggins who are charged with marketing our commercial site and we um, meet with them regularly. We have this all up on our website. 
Um, we do everything that we can do to support uh, attracting <coughs> commercial developers. Has there been any interest in that, that small parcel uh, on the southern end across from uh, Cole Morgan? As far as, yeah, right there. Uh, there was some interest, um, but it never, and, and this comes about a year ago, so it hasn't coalesced into any kind mm -hmm. of an offer. Um, okay. So the areas, the, the, the residential north of Ford Crossing, um, so that's really, I mean, the most fluid area. That's, that's pretty much no hard plan, no plan to come together or come before us anytime soon with right. roads or... Right. Right, because what we have in the pipeline is we have these houses and, and this which is going to come before you probably in December or January. So that's about 40 or more units already in the pipeline and there's a limit to what the market will absorb. So we don't want to compete against ourselves. Um, the other issue is as it gets more developed, then more interest from other developers is attracted to the site. Um, and this shows single family houses, but that's not necessarily what has to go there. It could be uh, cottages like this, that size bungalows, or it could be townhouses, um, depending on where the market goes next. Well, I guess, so this comes to a question we have usually every time you guys come before us is, what is the role of the CAC in terms of defining what the city wants for that area versus what mass development wants for that area? Where is that discussion happening? The, the CAC is in charge <coughs> of the master plan, so they've, they've, you know, recently updated. We've seen this, they've seen this update of the master plan, which came in March of this year. So um, was that the last time the CAC actually met to discuss this? Was back in March? When we met to discuss the master plan, yeah. Yeah. So I guess, uh, is there plans, Carol? I'm not sure if you know this or who, who, who monitors this, but... I mean, the CAC is supposed to be our voice, the city's voice, into what goes into that. Well, to a degree. I mean, they're really sort of even further removed than the planning board in terms of looking at the details. Now that the master plan has developed and evolved and really things have been, have been constructed under that plan, the role of the CAC is a little bit and then right we always come back fuzzy. to that same question yeah right's the wall because you know really at this point it's it's implementation and so now the planning board's jurisdiction is really <coughs> i think what overrides most of it is to ensure that it meets the standard under plan village in the zoning ordinance so um um i'm not sure more than just saying a mix of housing and and no commercial north of Ford Crossing is okay with them in terms of a master plan change. Um, well, I guess that's why. Beyond that, I'm not really sure there is any role for the CAC. And so at this point, it really is implementation and your um, charge. So is it really up to mass development can pretty much whatever they want to do north of Ford Crossing, <coughs> and the only input the city has is when they come to the planning board. Well, I mean, as long as what they're proposing is consistent with the master plan, and that's where you all get to say, well, you know, the the um, road alignment or the um, the number of housing units or the layout or what have you is not consistent with the zoning for Plan Village or the master plan. So, you, yeah, they're not really going to go back to the CAC for any specific development right. issues. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess because the master plan is is such a fluid plan. I mean, it it can change. Really, I think more if, as mass development wants to modify it rather than as the CAC drives it. So, if if mass development comes back to us in six months and says, "Hey, we got a developer who wants to do cluster north of Fort Crossing," and as opposed to what we see here, a single family. I don't know if that's. I wouldn't necessarily categorize that as a master plan issue. I think from. Um, from my interpretation, it's residential, mm -hmm. north of Ford Crossing. Right. And I think from a, from a zoning perspective, the Plan Village encourages a mix of housing types and um, locations. So if cluster was proposed by a developer north of Ford Crossing, I think that's very consistent with the Plan Village. And I don't think that's a master plan change. I mm -hmm. think that's why I'm saying I think the CAC is at such a high level saying, okay, residential. Right. No more mixed, you know, what Well, happened. the idea then of saying 
uh, take out the live work and make that assisted living. You know, that's they're working with the developer who's saying. Yeah, that's I think a that's great place too to much play. of a detail. I wouldn't right. even call that a master plan change. Yeah, okay. because I think the idea again was you would have a mix of assisted living, you'd have office, you'd have um, retail, restaurant, that kind of thing, and sort of the where those pieces fall out on the map is really for the planning board to m determine that it makes sense and it's connected and, and right but often by the time we see it it's pretty baked you know it's it's here's the proposal we have a developer ready to go here's a plan yeah. not there's there's not the discussion of what do we want to see there or what do we think would go right. there we right. see it usually when it's it's a plan right and that's because going back seven years ago now when the special permit for Plan Village was originally adopted there was another version of this that you saw that had you know, it didn't have Cole Morgan on it of course right. it so had 11 lots right. like anything like this right and that's I would say is more of a master plan change than whether or not assisted living is here or here yeah. um, and where live work might end up Beth, is there a provision for live work anywhere else? Sorry, Brandy, I keep going. Uh, no, there's only in the in the special permit. It only allows one assisted living of uh, no, no live work. If you if the assisted oh, goes for let says live work, is there a provision to put live? Yeah, work actually, about the male attendance building, right? Yeah, male yeah. attendance. We've looked at that. Um, you know, the, I think there's you know potential uh, in live work, and maybe not even artist live work. Maybe more office live work, where you'd have somebody who's upstairs who's an accountant. And has their office on the first floor. Um, I think that's very consistent, you know, with what's going on on Village Hill Road. Um, one thing I want to clarify is, you know, I, I know this is frustrating because everybody wants as much commercial development as possible, including the CAC. Um, and so, mass development is is an enabler of that process. We're investing 28 million to put in the roads and to to do the management. We and but it's commercially driven. We have to wait for that developer who says, yeah, this is a great development. Yes, I can put my market here on this corner. I can make a living. It's a great location. So, you know, it has to come together, the public mass development and the private developer agreeing that this is a good commercial area. I, as I was the planning board representative on the CAC, and the CAC is a committee of with just a lot of different various interests input. It's hardly the uh, organ of the city to, to input on the thing. But I voted against the master plan because of mass development's reluctance to consider a mixed housing on the north of on the north part of the Crescent, camp. Yeah. And I think what I'm saying is that we're not we're not reluctant to consider it at all. It's just that you have to put something there as a a starting point. It's not to say that you know townhouses can't go there. Multifamily. If you know somebody were to propose a three-story multifamily and they were a good developer, certainly we'd consider it. Yeah. Um, to neutralize my fussiness, last time we were together, um, I was up on the looking at the the memorial site this last weekend, and I that's a good lot for that it probably was a good one for you to give for that purpose but it's a really nice location for that and the other thing about having filled it out densely as much as you can to this point and then leaving that be is making it feel like it's a real community like it you know it's filling in so you just get that sense there and last um i'm not exactly sure what happened after the planning meeting the other day but there was some positive move on your part negotiating with the developer to give a little bit more screening there thank you you're welcome we're able to find three more spaces off-site any other questions from the board we um, open this up I guess to the public is anybody here from the public who have questions on the presentation So we don't need a, a motion or anything, right? The chair, Liz, no, is just for just our, yeah. our, our and this whole this whole meeting tonight is just um, no public hearing. So, however you, you want to engage it. Uh, Beth, quick, quick question: Has Mass Development given up on the existing building on the north end of the campus? Yes, yes. And and one of the reasons why, and we went over this with the CAC, we 
had, had kind of carved this road, a third road that went really close to the building um, um, foundation. And, and so it really wasn't, when the had engineers look at it again, it really wasn't a, a real road. It really couldn't be done. Um, and, and there was a whole list of other reasons, but another reason was that this was going to be the last thing to develop, and the building was very deteriorated already, um, and so we just didn't feel like leaving it there as a deteriorating building mm -hmm. with the vandalism that's associated, um, that that was a, a good move. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think the carriage house needed a new roof just to be in kind of... Right. Well, they did that to work for the carriage house. And that other building's still there, but... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. Mm -hmm. in, in the, in the I don't know if it's next. Assisted living? The 11th. Is the next hearing? The yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. You didn't get your tech package already? Weeks ago. <laughs> it came today. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, Jen, I'm spent. Okay, I'm not even going to be at the meeting. <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, moving on, I'd like to open up a hearing for 715 for review of comments from public meetings on proposed residential zoning changes. <laughs> What's, uh, sorry, not a hearing. Um, yeah. so this, is ba this is basically your chance to finally discuss as a group the comments that came out of those two meetings. Most of you that um, came to one or both of those. So um, I think, and I sent in the staff report, and just sort of the, the list of the list of comments. Um, and you know, I think um, uh, we can go through that general discussion. You were there, so you heard a lot of it. Um, and then sort of talk about well, it, what we've done at a staff level since that to sort of continue the conversation and provide more data based on the questions that arose um, and also let you know that um, we're planning on staff is planning to uh, speak with or go attend a ward three meeting about the zoning and they've asked specific questions there's they've certainly raised the question it was raised at um, one or both actually both sessions the issue about design and maybe getting into a little bit more detail on design uh, maybe not so much for single-family homes but maybe under a townhouse or um, new multifamily um, development scenario so we can look at what the language is now for design that sort of establishes a base um, baseline for the facades of buildings uh, along the street. Um, and then just the other thing I want to throw out there is that uh, because this meeting is set up for October 17th, it probably makes sense for you guys to continue discussion and then ultimately wait to hear if there are other comments that you all haven't heard after that October 17th meeting um, at that sort of at that ward level mm -hmm. uh, before moving anything forward. Um, so, you know, we talked, so the, the couple, this is going back to the comments, um, there was a lot of discussion back and forth about the zoning and um, its ability to encourage walkability um, by allowing more units in town and sort of reflecting what the what's on the ground um, in the neighborhoods. There were questions about whether you know the zoning might generate more traffic on local streets, but reduce overall traffic on major streets as uh, people who are um, currently unable to live in Northampton but really want to live in Northampton still come to Northampton for services and schools and things like that um, and there was discussion about the need for housing options at different levels and uh, the incentives that it might provide for the reuse of historic buildings or a concern was also raised about whether or not this might encourage demolition and reconstruction uh, we've had some more conversation internally about that and conversations with the building inspector, so we can talk about that. Um, there were, uh, again, design details were considered important and that maybe we need to look at design a little uh, in more detail. 
and discussion and debate on whether the changes might result in a shift in community character and what that might um, entail and related to that unanticipated consequence of encouraging more development in the outlying areas and whether or not we should be setting a set of setting up a standard for rules that apply to everyone or set up a standard on a case-by-case -case special permit basis based on whoever walks in the door you know a gets to get their permit but b doesn't and what are the parameters for that and you all have had that conversation a bit but that came up in the meeting um, and there was clearly an interest in creating improved pedestrian facilities particularly if there's if they're uh, related to the concern about more density and needing to make sure that we had safe pedestrian and bicycle routes and facilities um, and also why the question came up in the second meeting about why there weren't uh, it wasn't a proposal to increase the number of units in the urban residential a and why was it only proposed for B and C or the allowance of more flexibility in B and C versus a so that sort of raises the question well should we look does it go back to whether we should look at map changes for A? Do some of those A's that you all talked about not make sense? <laughs> um, or does it make sense to say, well, we will allow accessory apartments in all residential districts? Should we, instead of saying necessarily accessory apartments, maybe two family in URA? So that's something I think that you guys can discuss or think about. Um, and uh, so that's that's basically the framework for that and then what you're looking at Stephen is um, a map that I put together with our GIS person because the question did come up you know how much how many how much is this really going to change our neighborhoods and the one thing that we could do um, fairly readily it's not going to be hundred percent accurate but it gives a sense is determine you know how many lots if you change the lot size from whatever the existing lot size is to 5,000 or 3,000 square feet with 50 feet of frontage, how many new lots would that really enable to be developed? So we could do that based on existing frontages and get a general sense of how many lots that means. Um, but there are a whole bunch of caveats associated with that because some people might have an existing home with 100 feet of frontage and they might not want to carve up their parcel and they might want to keep it at 100 feet of frontage or they might have you know even more than that and it's the back land that's not developed so those are the th unknowns that you know we can't determine w what would happen but we threw a lot of those parcels into the mix anyway um, and so I can put that map up on the board but it really shows that combined with sort of vacant parcels that haven't been developed and then those that are sort of oversized Mm -hmm. It's a very small percentage of the overall number of parcels in each of these districts. I think that'd be help helpful because at the, the first, I was at the first meeting mm -hmm. and I got a sense when we were talking about this about, you looked at the reductions to the current zoning and people saw these huge number drops and, and square footage drops up on a slide while people were talking and you saw a 60% reduction or 8,000 square feet reduction and and I, I think the perception was we're reducing what exists today physically and that's not the case we're reducing what exists from a zoning sense but we're it's a reflection of what exists today physically and so I think this I, I think people are thinking my, my neighbor's gonna throw up a two-family house on a little 20-foot parcel and there's gonna be squeezing in houses all over the place and it'll be bedlam and that's not the case at all and I think it would be helpful if we could show it, it's a small percentage we're talking about and we're, and we're talking about getting the zoning to reflect what exists today um, so that we can move forward. In my mind, if 80% of the neighborhoods that we collectively think make Northampton desirable don't meet current zoning, that just that doesn't make sense because that's, those are the neighborhoods you'd want to promote, you'd want to have more of, and you can't. I thought it was a fair question and I, I know it, it's a lot of work on your part to go in and start parsing out dimensions of lots and, and trying to work with. so first I, I I'm really interested in seeing the map mm -hmm. and you can't project what the 
sales or change of ownership or intended use. You know, you, you can't, you can't, there are a lot of assumptions that are going to have to be made to say how many, how many changes would result from it. Right. So, but, I mean, I think, I think we ought to be honest about it. It, it is to keep from pushing the city further out. I mean, that is, I went back and read the uh, Sustainable Northampton, and I've got in front of me the letter from the from the zoning commission that we created, and, and that's exactly what we want to do. Mm -hmm. But not by tucking in buildings everywhere, but by better using the buildings we have. Yeah, because one of the things about the ZRC, because um, I was on the ZRC and we worked on this for, I don't know, two and a half years, um, was a lot of the infill we were, we were hoping to promote, you would never be able to tell it actually happened. For example, someone with a 3,000 square foot Victorian who simply wants to convert the, up to the third floor into an apartment. Mm -hmm. From the outside, you would never be able to tell that the <coughs> actual conversion occurred. So it wasn't always about new buildings or carving off a lot from a big lot to make another building. It's it was often part. about being able to take an existing structure which would easily be able to be divided into another unit and to have an infill without actually having to do anything to the building itself, which isn't allowed now. And also we have a lot of buildings that were, that once were multifamily houses yeah. that were converted to single family. And because of the changes to the zoning, they could never be converted back. So once you went down from a two to a one or a three to a two, because of the zoning, you could never go back up again. Mm -hmm. And that was also one of the things that we were really trying to look at is, is to try to put these houses back to the way they were originally intended to be built. Right. So. Um, yeah, so a lot of what we looked at was not necessarily new construction. It was simply being able to take and modify an existing structure. Um, so I'm just going to, uh, I want to see, I'll put this view on the screen first and see how it, uh, how yeah. it, if, you can, if it's visible enough. Uh, I might need to go to the other view, but let me just... Yeah, I don't think this is going to work. Um, I have to go to the other. Oops. I might need to pull it up in PDF. Oh, dear. Um, let me just minimize some of this stuff. So what, what we did was we started with the, um, and what we're going to have to do is sort of, I'm going to zoom in here and um, show you, but, um, and Stephen, you have the numbers there offhand, but if we start sort of with the URA, I'm going to zoom in here, and um, I'm going to have to turn, I'll turn off the lights as well so we can sort of see this a little bit better, but the initial um, grab for this, um, for this map was to look at uh, what parcels currently had um, over 100 feet of frontage um, with buildings on them. So we kind of, and this is, so if we start in Leeds and you, in urban residential A, and just um, look at this for a second. So That's the yellow, is that correct? The yellow, the bright yellow are all the lots that popped up. They currently have homes on them, um, which are those black dots, essentially, and I'll zoom in a little bit more. Um, so um, the, the little squares indicate a house, so it's basically our building layer taken from photometric um, ortho photos. So um, there are these yellow dots in Leeds with homes, but the frontages are more than a hundred feet, um, and so potentially you could, let's say, if you know, you might have 50 feet along here where you could draw drop a line down here and get a minimum 5,000 square feet with 50 feet of frontage, but we don't know about topography, we don't know about wetlands, and so this right here is the little mini golf putting place on um, Route 9. 
that is full of wetlands. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's showing up here as yellow because it has a huge amount of frontage and it's an urban residential A. I don't think this could ever be developed and we should probably take it off of this map, but it's, but it's sort of an example of um, what we could do with sort of an automated setup um, for that. And, the, and we did the same thing. Um, so then, Stephen, if you could read that number for urban residential A, and I'll move down the map. So it's those yellow spots have lots of frontage, but again, we didn't, it, there are caveats of whether people would want to do that to their property and whether or not there are too steep slopes or wetlands that would prevent them from doing it. So in URA, you say there, there in all of URA, there's possibly 10 vacant parcels. No, so do the, do the 44 one, the Oh, the and then in URA, lots. there's possibly uh, 44 large lots that could be divided uh, into uh, buildable lots, which is what 5.8 percent of URA. Right. So 5.8 percent of all the lots within the urban residential A district are larger, have lar frontages larger than 100, and but currently have structures on them that you could potentially develop. So that's 5 percent of those lots. Then, so then if you, so this area here is all urban residential A, and these are um, um, similar lots, although these, the other piece that we didn't look at is how much of these um, vacant lots are owned by the, and currently are non-conforming, and so you'd have to make the abutting lot conforming. So there may be some vacant parcels that are really necessary to the open space and the, um, and the minimum lot size for the lot that has the structure on it. Mm -hmm. Say that again for me. So, so let's look at this example here of an urban residential A neighborhood. This is north of Florence Center. Okay. Um, I might be able to find this out now, but this is Hillcrest actually. So this house, um, I could take pick this apart and look at it. I didn't have time to do the detail and say, okay, is this owned by the same person who owns this or by the own, who owns this? And, you know, potentially you could then build on this lot that was never built upon because the zoning right now wouldn't, doesn't allow it, but it might be necessary under current zoning. This person, if they owned the adjacent lot, needs this lot to conform with zoning because this lot might not be as big. But if you look at this, it's the same size as all these other lots. It just can't be built on under the current regulations. Um, so of the... Well, wait, I think that's important. I mean, we've been saying that we're doing, that we're, that we're trying to make the zoning match the neighborhoods. And I think that that has been viewed as, no, it's, it's not going to match if we're infilling. But this is the kind of lot you've been thinking about. Right. 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 And that's what we what we did the duplex for a couple of Right, exactly. Yeah. On all precisely. Yeah. And that's one of so on the ZRC, I think we might have talked about this, but the ZRC looked at North Maple, Walnut Street and Ward Three. We looked at streets in town in, in the town that people wanted to live in or that they thought it was being good neighborhoods. None of which could be built using today's zoning. They were all built before zoning. It could never be built with the current zoning. But what we were trying to do was come up with zoning that would allow us to recreate what we have today. And that, that is a good case. Those lots may now be able to be built, and they're exactly the same size as the houses, on, the lots on the other side. But with the zoning today, you couldn't build on right. So, and then, so of the vacant parcels in urban residential A, I think it says there are 10, Stephen, is that what it ten. says in that part? Yeah. So there are 10 of these such lots in the urban residential A that we could find on this sort of um, broad um, analysis of, the, of all the parcels. So that's, I think, what does it say, less than 1% of all the one lots? 1% of. 1% um, of, the, of the lots that are, are vacant. And again, it would mean that, you know, potentially someone might be able to say, okay, now that double double lot that I thought I had maybe is actually a double lot or maybe not, maybe they want to hold on to it or again maybe it is wet maybe there's a drainage just a run suit and that's why it was never built upon um, so that's 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 sort of a in a nutshell on the percentages um, we did the same thing for um, B and C districts and um, so uh, in B there's some of these um, 
This is um, Florence, just south of Florence Center. So there's some of these larger parcels. This happens to be the church lot here. So there are two big buildings on it. There's lots of frontage. I don't know what the church is going to do with that parcel, but you know that might be a candidate for saying, okay, we're going to demo a building, or maybe not. We're going to preserve a building, but we still have room to carve off a single-family house or something because they want to maximize, you know, benefits off the lot. Sure. So in this case, I'm sorry, Carolyn. Purple means a big lot that could be carved up. Yes, in the urban residential B district, in, in, I differentiated the districts by color. Oh, okay. But then all the ones that are colored right now in this color. Right. are lots that already have structures on them and just because of their frontages we highlighted them but it doesn't necessarily mean that more development is able to be accomplished on that parcel um, so you know there's this big triangular lot I think that's park um, in Florence and and um, many of these you can see you know it might result in uh, and then the number is I think three percent or something like that you are yeah. the possible vacant parcels are 27 which is 0.9 percent and possible large lots to divide there's 113 which is just under four percent um, of all the parcels in in the B district right. so they're kind of there's scattered um, throughout the darker ones are the um, ones with buildings and then there's some that are the modeled colors that um, are existing vacant but again they're much fewer than um, than they are for the larger oversized lots um, and I actually now see one I think that may oh no that's another line so again and, and then so going moving towards downtown Northampton the urban residential C areas there are a few oversized parcels um, in C, I think the numbers even the percentage is even less. Um, Are you about the numbers for C? Yeah. So in URC, the possible vacant parcels are 17, which is 1.8 percent of URC, and the possible large lots to divide there's 16, which is about 1.7 percent. Yeah. Um. So and and. I think that and we pointed we had some examples on the slide at least the second night of, of you know spots on on some of those streets where there are it's just the Olive Street situation again where you have an empty tooth as it were in the mm -hmm. in the block face um, that might be able to um, contain another structure so you know we could do that by mapping as to give the general sense um, and then um, so I think that you know we're fairly comfortable with those numbers again they're caveats to the right. to those and then of course there's the issue the different issue which I think would come up in even renovations or additions for houses is sort of to think about design standards and, you know we have the basic um, design uh, criteria that's spelled out and then I'm just trying to pull up the Carolyn, this way. does not speak to the question of taking what was a triplex and putting it back into triplex in terms of density. No, no. right. I mean, because any idea about numbers that would might increase density, because that's an alternative to increasing building, is to increase density. I mean. Right. So the way, the reason why that's the difficult um, part of the equation is that the open space and parking is the cap essentially to the number of units you can put on your house so you might have a three family or that has gone to a two family and the lot is is um, built out to um, a, an extent that wouldn't allow you to put more parking on the site so we wouldn't re we that's a real case-by-case -case basis right. on mm -hmm. looking at evaluating that um, so but again it's what what we've for the large part oh so, so to go back about the three family the other piece of it is in talking to the building commissioner three units is the is the sort of the tipping point where you have to start including up updating and your building code requirements go up you need sprinklers at a three family. at three at right. three. So for a three family, that means you're going to be investing a whole lot more. So in a sense, it, it um, 
it potentially is, I guess there, there's twofold. One is it means you're going to have to comply with stretch code. So you have an old home and now all of a sudden you're going to have to completely change the envelope of your of your structure, which is a good thing. That's what we want to try to encourage. I mean, that's the that's one of the downsides of of these older homes is they're horribly inefficient in terms of energy consumption. And so to the extent that we're generating um, a feasibility for people to invest in their homes and upgrade them and reduce their consumption, that has a positive benefit. But it also means that they've got to spend a little bit extra, especially if they're going to a three family, to put in sprinklers. And that is- but That's not required for a two family. Yeah. Right. Um, so I, that may be another sort of check mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, people are concerned about this rampant um, influx of new units that really if you're, and if you're going, if you have a three family and you want to add another one, that will be the trigger too. Mm -hmm. So then you have to do all four units if you're right. going from a three to a four. Um, I'm just trying, I was going to pull up the spreadsheet or uh, the the zoning chart just to look at throw out the design um, piece so just give me that here. so currently the design um, um, column is really the same for each of the districts and it has a base basic um, basic parameters that requires garage structures or other other parking structures to be set back behind the facade so the garage isn't the front piece that's eating up the whole street right. frontage and potentially changing the character of those historic um, neighborhoods um, front doors must face the street. Front porches of at least six feet deep and eight feet long must be included. And for new buildings, setback scale ma and massing should fit in with the block face. Planning board has the ability to waive by site plan approval any of these elements if it can be shown that through another design standard, the similar um, functionality um, or design um, um, and pedestrian scale can be met. So that's sort of what's on the table now. And some of this came directly out of the state hospital design standards. So the design guidelines for development at the state hospital have the front porch criteria and the door facing. So we wanted to take something that we already have. And incidentally, the um, lots on Long Mosier Street are a good example of the of 50 feet of frontage um, single family house lot that are going that are under construction now so mm -hmm. we sort of know what that can look like the bungalows the bungalows right they actually range from 44 feet of frontage up to 60 feet of frontage so they're not all um, uniform mm -hmm. but i think that new the one model home that's going up now is on a 44 foot frontage lot mm -hmm. Um, I think the issue, at least the way I understand it, from some of the um, Ward 3 residents who had who wanted to have sort of a go down and talk in more details about the proposed zoning um, in terms of design were concerned maybe not necessarily about single family homes, but about, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you get a big multifamily or a townhouse and how do the designs, how should we have more detail for that kind of structure? design detail yeah. right mm -hmm. and I think it's a valid point I just think that you know this is sort of the I you know it's a first step into design for any residential structures other than what we have at Village Hill mm -hmm. there was also a comment at one of the meetings um, about a homeowner who wanted to know which zone they were in and thought that they had not been apprised of the zone they bought into and I went and looked, and it's on your MLS listing, but otherwise, how would someone in the audience know what zone? If they had a question about what zone they were in, what would they do? Well, all of our, um, all, the par all the zoning for every parcel in the city is listed in a table on our website. 
Um, we also have the maps, the physical maps by your assessor in map ID. So if you go to the so website. So it's on my tax bill? It, it, I don't know if it's on your tax bill because the assessors really don't like zoning. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they try not to mention it at all, okay. which I don't, it I don't understand. Exist, right. Right. Well, I, just, I, I think it would be harder maybe for someone who's been in their house for decades to figure it out than it yeah. would be if you just bought one. If you just bought yeah. one, it's right there. Right. So, okay. I mean, they can, you know, and if they can't find it on the computer, they can always call us. And I mean, we answer those questions all the time. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Want to hear from the public? Oh, just one, one other thing that did come up a lot, I'm not sure how people th what think, people think about this, is is URA still the idea that, you know, single family only in URA? You know, and that even the new zoning doesn't Well, I think that's, a, yeah, I think you, I think that question arose and it, it is valid to sort of look at, um, I'm just going to pull the map here. Right. Historically, URA has been single family. I think there was a, an attempt years ago to, to, to add it, to make it multifamily houses available in URA, and that didn't pass the city council. Hmm. Uh, well, one of the things that I know more recently in the last 10 years, there were some areas, you know, there's there are a few um, blocks here and there of URA that are surrounded by URB and right, you look at the map that. and you think about planning and what's a rational sort of direction in terms of planning a city and you can't quite get your, wrap your hands around why there's a pocket here and a pocket there and so the city did try to look at um, rezoning from A to, to B to be consistent with what was surrounding it and um, you know, it was met with some controversy from the people who lived in the URA district. Um, so we haven't addressed it again, but I think, if I recall correctly at the time, the concern was that B allows two families, and um, potentially by special permit, three families at the time. Um, so I think this time around, the idea was, well, allow some um, modification to the zoning district itself to allow new single-family house lots potentially but um, maybe not address the two-family issue even though these a districts are you know walking distance from the bike path walking distance from Florence Center or walking distance from schools and the bike path here and you know from to downtown and, and the bike path and the river trail and all of that so you know it I think certainly from a staff perspective we weren't um, sure that the benefit the number of units we might see in a would be so beneficial as to offset um, the conversation the wrangling and the, the, the um, politics of it so um, that's why staff initially suggested, well, let's change the lot size instead of really talking about the use, the underlying uses, and the unit. It might even be good, I mean, uh, for members of the audience and anybody who's actually watching us on television, to talk about what the process is. You know, what are the next steps in this process? Because we, I don't think we covered it. I was at the meeting on Wednesday. I don't think. It, yeah. But yeah. basically what's going to happen is the planning board will make or not make a recommendation to the city council. City council is the, the governing body who makes the decisions about zoning. The planning board makes recommendations to the city council, but the, the city council itself is the one who adopts zoning. The, the city council will then take it and then refer it out to a subcommittee, their ordinance uh, subcommittee, which actually will meet again with us. Those two committees will make yet another recommendation back to the city council, and it's up to the city council to make the eventual vote as to whether or not any of this zoning is adopted. It's a little convoluted because we're going to make a recommendation in some form that may or may not come back to us from the city council but ultimately it's the city council not the planning board that passes zoning so it's not a fast process and it's not i mean it's particularly this one because it's been under conversation for five six years so right, right. and this pro yeah this process started years ago so. right yeah, it took us five years just to get to this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, want to hear from public? Uh, this isn't really a hearing. This is just a presentation. But 
uh, just for the sake of order. Yeah, if you want to raise your hand and I'll call on you, just uh, state your name and, and um, come to the podium for the yeah, come to the podium and, and let's hear what you have to say. So, yeah, the one in the back. I'm Jane Rainey, Seven Lane, Ruby Road, and most of you are new from the last meeting I've come to. That's an old face. And <laughs> <laughs> more ways than one. <laughs> My street is URA, as is Ward Avenue, because of deed restrictions. And I don't think any of you were here when we uh, had to fight that out. We all came to, I think, 12 meetings. And I also have a request, because a lot of us were hearing aids, that you use your microphones. It's really been difficult to hear you. And my last request is that my street is going to be very impacted by the Clark School development. We've had loads of meetings. Devin is the only one from your board who's come. And we really, you really need to know what we are thinking because no minutes are taken. There's no best practices. There's no Robert's rules. It's been terrible. Okay. Thank you. Can I just ask a question? What meetings about yeah. Clark School? <laughs> and we can't attend meetings yeah, outside you, of this room. Yeah, you can't. But can you clarify that? That we can't do, that we yeah, cannot sure. do Yeah, the planning board is not allowed to attend um, neighborhood meetings about projects that they will ultimately make a decision about because it's considered um, ex parte <laughs> contact and, and um, discussion of, of projects outside of an official public hearing. How do they get the facts from the neighbors then? At the official public hearing in this venue. Hi, um, my name is David Drake. I live at 321 Locust Street, um, which is, uh, if, if you're very local, two doors away from F.J. Rogers. Um, and uh, I would, my wife and I were very happy to uh, choose that house because it uh, represents a lot of the values of, of, uh, of, of an infill uh, community. It's, it steps away from uh, shopping and from uh, the bike path and from uh, banking and from all kinds of services and we're, we're, we're active users of all those services. Um, I'm also, I'm speaking uh, of my own opinion tonight, but I'm also chairman of the Historical Commission um, and I'm the second largest, longest serving member of the Community Preservation Committee. I usually see Devin is sitting tonight and um, also on the uh, Citizen Advisory Board of the, of the um, uh, Village Hill, um, I wanted to say hospital, Village Hill uh, development. So I'm, um, uh, I'm certainly a supporter of, of the notion that, uh, that infill and density are essential for uh, uh, communities that have sustainability. Uh, that's not a problem and I know in my own view, both personally and professionally, 